Hello, hello again, Booktube. Uh, my review, second video that I'm publishing today, of uh, Bewilderment by Richard Powers, which is uh, uh, shortlisted now for the Booker, uh, the Booker Prize. And this is a wonderful book. I, you know, I've read three books. The last three books I've read, not counting the consumer, which I read after this, um, two of them are definitely going to be in my top ten, and two of them I suspect will be. Uh, tilting at the top five reads of this year. The first was 53 Days. I'll post the link to my review of that. Um, if you don't know, the other video I'm posting today is my review of The Consumer by Michael Jira, which is not as good. But I want to talk about this and this alone in this video. So Robin is on the cusp of his ninth birthday. He has behavioural uh, issues and sort of quick to temper and is in trouble at school a lot. Uh, he's been examined by various specialists and has been his father has been given three different diagnoses that you know somewhere on the autism scale or ADHD or something and his father is desperate to um, avoid his son being given you know psychoactive uh, drug um, but you know he is having to manage his son's uh, mood swings and behavioural issues and stuff, and has got quite good at reading them and in handling and, and tamping down some of them, but not all of them. So that's, that's, that's the plot of this book, really. Um, now, it's all too easy to label, uh, even though there are three different labels that have been applied to Robin, but maybe... You know, he's just sad and angry because he's lost his mother to a car crash and obviously the father lost his wife. And this is him acting out. And, you know, why wouldn't they be sad? You know, this is the father on his late wife when he's sort of recalling how they met. The fit between us was rough but useful. I gave her stamina and fed her curiosity. She taught me optimism and appetite, albeit plant-based. There it was. Roll the dice and find your life catalyzed by another, one who ten minutes later or three seats further down at another computer screen would have remained an undetected signal from deep space. So the father has a really interesting um, profession. He models like potential life on other planets. Now this this was fascinatingly drawn and, and, and sort of mirrors something that I felt for a long time about science fiction, that we have always assumed until recently that if there is to be life on other planets, it has to have water and it has to have oxygen. So our search for suitable planets has demanded that those planets have oxygen and water and obviously other things like, you know, temperate climate and all this sort of stuff. Um, and as his father points out, that there are so many strange environments on Earth, such as, uh, you know, deep underwater trenches and thermal vents and things like that, where life clings on. You know, there is life and it's unique, strange life, unlike no other life in the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom, that actually you need to be much more open to what we're looking for on other planets to sustain life. So he studies the um, sort of chromato chromatographic bands of colours of planets, which tells you what their composition is and of, of their atmospheres and stuff. And his work is modelling potential life on these planets. And one of the things he does with his son is he spins in tales of planets and what life looks like on that. A bit like um, David Eagleman's son, 40 Tales of the Afterlife, it's sort of an imaginative projection of all different types of life <clears throat> that are far removed from life as we understand it on Earth. And, and he and his son have a very good sort of relationship about that. His wife, his dead wife, was uh, an environmentalist, absolutely active and banging down the doors of the local um, Congress and spreading it to eight other state congresses, uh, mainly about animal extinction. Um, and Robin has a tinge of that, but he's unable to express it, he's unable to grapple with it. He's, he sort of has the same sensibility as his mother, and that is uh, described as, my son was a troubled boy hurt by seeing what sleepwalking world could not. So although he's called neurodivergent, 
actually, maybe he's just ahead of the curve. Maybe he's so sensitive to the threat to the planet and life on our planet that we're the neurodivergent ones because we can't see that or we can't let it uh, influence our daily lives when it absolutely should. So it's an interesting sort of reversal of, of what our take on neurodivergency is. And if you've ever read any R.D. Lang when he sort of talked about schizophrenia as being largely socially constructed by the definition of what, what madness is, it sort of overlaps with that and again is, is very, very interesting. So there are all these sort of things going on um, that, are on, that are beautifully set up. I mean, the relationship between father and son is so tender. It's so beautiful. There's not a word wasted. And, and just, it's not there's not a word wasted. The words are very precise. So, for example, uh, Robin is going to, is, is doing an interview for a social media platform for a reason that I'll, I'll come on, on to. And in this interview, he gives a staggering answer. And the way that Powers wrote it was, so, you know, Robin is being interviewed by someone holding a video camera. And the way Powers writes it is, the video blinked first, i.e. The, the interview ended, the, the camera turned away before Robin turned away. It's just such a beautifully simple and elegant and yet absolutely precise nailing of, of what's going on there. So then we get into... A treatment that is not involving drugs that um, Robin's father seriously considers because the school are basically threatening to, to throw Robin out because of his worsening behaviour. And his dad really has no other options left if he's not going to go down the drug route. So this treatment is um, very much in the experimental form where a load of average people's brain patterns are mapped for you know, calm, serene, happy, still different emotional states. And then all of those are brought together to average them out. And that people who have trouble with those emotional states are then uh, put into, um, I suppose it's a bit like an MRI scanner, but it's more active than a scanner. And mentally they do these tasks with their, their eyes and their minds, sort of plotting dots on big dots or rearranging things but it's not about that task it's about they have to enter the empathic same state as these averaged out states and if they can inhabit that it's supposed to regulate their own behavior that's the theory and robin does very well at this and it does seem to improve his behavior and then he's offered the chance to inhabit his mother's brain pants are so not an average of, of a lot of people but specifically his own mother because his mother and his father were early guinea pigs supplying their brain patterns to, to this. Um, and as he, uh, as he sort of undergoes the sort of brain realignment training, whatever you want to call it, uh, with his mother, he becomes, she sort of, she sort of inhabits him. Um, now, is that the science is, you know, or is it just a sympathetic magic that he, what, you know, in a way he's able to reclaim her, she's dead, but by the sort of powerful belief that, that, that her brain patterns still live on, that he's able to uh, internalise that and respond. And his behaviour just completely levels out and he's absolutely, you know, well adjusted. Because he's got his mum back on some level, you know, he's been unable to keep her alive. And now not only has he got access to her, but he's internalised her. She's with him. Um... And now his, his sort of environmental protest becomes much more honed, just like his mother's, because he's got a greater understanding of it, maybe through channelling her or, or whatever. And now he takes his protest um, out public. And there is a sort of a Greta Thunberg figure uh, who he never meets. She only exists online because she's in, a, in a, another country. And it's not overdone. It's there for two or three sections, no more. And I have to say that the sections in here are very short. As somebody's car alarm goes off irritatingly. So now the book moves on again. So, it, you know, it's established the tender relationship of father and son. We're told the mother has died. We're told about his behavioural problems. We're told we're offered the neurodivergency stuff. We're offered the maybe he's just sad 
and you know and then we get the treatment and his improvement in behavior now it does change slightly because there is a slight you know his behavior is much more regulated uh so his father is having less stress except because robin's message is now take it out to the public he's becoming public property because of course this is a revolutionary experimental treatment and once it gets out and the the scientists behind it want it to get out because they want to make money from it um you know his his son now is is no longer anonymous and that causes greater strains on the relationship as, as the father's now trying to protect him in a different way he's no longer trying to protect him from getting kicked out of school or being bullied for being different or, or whatever or protect him from himself now he's protecting him from being public property and the book does change slightly in its tone it's slightly less it's less intimate i think at that point but it's entirely illogical to you know that decision makes sense by powers i just preferred if we'd kept it at a, at a more intimate level but you know i still enjoyed it and i'm not going to give a a, a spoiler uh, on the ending i will say the ending was hugely uh disappointing and unbelievable but because the rest of the book was so beautiful so tender so masterfully written conjuring up so many issues and ideas in such an elegant non-preachy way i didn't care about the ending it's literally five ten pages the rest of the book just is supreme five stars definitely in my top five although obviously some more books may come along between now and december but i doubt it i just highly recommend this i haven't read the overstory but it seems Powers is very motivated by environmental issues and, and after all, you know, why not? Um, I was put off by its size, I was put off by its conceit of sort of trees as narrators or at least overseers. Um, this is a whole different kettle of fish, although I may now go and read the overstory because I, I've so, so fell in love with this. So uh, there you have it, five stars. Uh, till next time, thank you very much.